We all struggle with feeling like there's not enough time in the day to be productive personally or professionally. We all struggle to make our time matter. It's time to take control. It's time to start investing in the corporation of you. At Athena, they've helped over 700 ambitious professionals achieve more by connecting them with best in class globally remote executive assistants. Athena executive assistants go beyond basic administration tasks. They help you make time matter through the art of delegation. They believe delegation is the superpower of all highly successful people. And your personal EA will help you get there. Your EA is a one on one long term partner to help you achieve your personal and professional goals. Take back your time. Join the waitlist at athenago.com. That's athenago.com. I mean, no one plans to get sick. And yet, here we are. My name is Matthew Zachary. A quarter century ago, I was given six months to live with a diagnosis of terminal brain cancer. For more than 15 years, I've been ranting and raving on the air about stupid cancer and now stupid healthcare, and I'm just getting warmed up. So let's all go make healthcare suck less together because you know what? We're all out of patience. Hey, that's the name of the show. Today's ad-free episode of Out of Patience is made possible by our friends at Exact Sciences, makers of Cologuard. Hello, friends. Welcome back to Out of Patience. This is Matthew Zachary. We got a good one for you today. These genius human beings who've done all sorts of insane things to make life a whole lot better for all of us. Dr. Paul Lindbergh is the chief medical officer at Exact Science. And Dr. Nick Papadopoulos, he's a professor of oncology and pathology at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. I love being the dumbest guy in the room. Among the many things we talk about, is it possible to not get cancer a whole lot more than it used to be? Do we have to go organ by organ based on cancer treatment, or can there be Highlander? There can be only one blood test for multiple cancers. Okay, so I don't do a great Sean Connery. We get into this concept of meditainment, which I guess is this, this show, meditainment, healthcare, healthertainment, I'm making words up. And of course, we dive into the product known as Cologuard, which I think is a miracle. You can poop on a stick and it's going to tell you your risk for colon cancer, even if it's this thing called pre-cancer, and that's the term we're using, before you actually get the real cancer. So this is the show about how the sausage is made. Uh, thank you very much. And Dr. Papadopoulos is the guy that made the machine that made the sausage. And here we go. Gentlemen, welcome to Out of Patience. Really a thrill to have you guys here. And there's so much to unpack. I really want to start with a disclaimer to the listeners. This is potentially a very nerdy show, but we'll attempt to hit the jargon button as often as possible and switch ourselves into high school education mode to explain to people what this really means. I wanted to start with Paul. You've been in academia for a very long time. What's your perception of getting complicated information distilled to average people? Yeah, I think that these are such important messages. There's so much going on in some of the areas that we'll touch on today, but it is complex. And I think that we need to be able to make sure that the advances, the messages that we think are most important can resonate and be understood by the people who can benefit from some of the technologies that we'll talk about. Yeah. And Nick, we're going to get to how the sausage is made. You made the machine that made the sausage and you're full on medical genetic academia. Are you supposed to talk person or is it best suited for you to stay in that lane of just being a genius to genius guy? No, I think it's important not to stay in the genius to genius guy and talk person. As Paul said, I mean, those are very complex things, but also very important. They have to do with our health and, and how to be proactive about our health. So, you know, trying to distill this to what is the main message and, and the thesis line for this, is, I think is going to be important. So let's go back in time. Uh, maybe not to Back to the Future, maybe to like Pulp Fiction, right? The early 90s when this idea of your DNA is something that's more than just things that live on Jurassic Park's tour. Can you speak to the first kindlings of conversation around genetics as a modern day conversation? Yeah, I mean, it started 
before the 90s, I think the 90s, we started having an idea that the DNA could be one of the ways that we can actually give this information to individuals. And the early 90s, I think, was the first, I think it was 91 or 92, actually, the first at least scientific evidence that the DNA can be used for what we're going to be talking today. Right. And by the way, that was Pulp Fiction. So I was dead on with my pop culture yeah, yeah, references. <laughs> Tarantino for the win. All right, Paul, your take on that. I like to think of it maybe even a little bit more broadly, Matthew. So what we want to do is we want to be able to identify tumors before they become more difficult or impossible to treat. DNA is one thing that we need to be focused on, but we're really looking for those signals, whatever they are, that come from a tumor that we can detect in blood, that we can detect in other uh, specimens so that we can identify patients who deserve a treatment before they become symptomatic. And actually, if to follow that, the first evidence that I mentioned, it was actually, at least in scientific literature, in urine. And it had to do with DNA and also with proteins. So I guess, was it really any surprise to go from, oh, your hair is blonde because of genetics to the way in which our bodies interact with disease and medications is not that dissimilar? Yeah, I'll start and Nick will add on to this, I'm sure. But, you know, really all DNA does is it's a blueprint. It's a coding system that allows the body to produce, you know, more or less of different proteins. Those proteins have a job to do. Part of the job that proteins do is to control normal cellular growth. When that process gets interrupted, we have abnormal cellular growth. Sometimes that turns into precancers or even cancers. And that's where we need to identify what are those changes, what are those alterations in our genetic code or anything on top of the genetic code that is important to that carcinogenesis or cancer formation process? And then how can we intervene so that we can change the course that would otherwise have happened? I agree. And, you know, one of the things that maybe, at least in my circles, we're saying, what was the biggest surprise of the last 20, 30 years? That cancer is a genetic disease. And that means, uh, you know, as Paul said, changes in the DNA, but also what happens on the DNA. But in the end, those changes that they will cause this pre-cancer and eventual cancer, yeah, those are the changes that actually now we can take advantage of and detect them in blood. Those changes, there are some of them are very specific to the cancer cells. So detecting that signal can allow us to actually detect in the blood individuals that they have cancer. They actually, what they do is, they translate in change in proteins and how the body actually reacts. So it's a cascade of events that eventually will make a cell to be a cancer cell and eventually grow and in some cases kill the individual. So Nick, let's talk about acronyms, right? What is MCED? For the purposes of the listeners, let's unpack, and you call it MSED, right? Correct. Yes, we call them MSED. What is it? New. It's multi-cancer early detection tests in the okay. end. The T is not part M of said the t- <laughs> M said the test. <laughs> exactly. That's what it is. And what those tests do is, as the acronym indicates, can detect multiple cancers. Multiple, what I mean with that is different type of cancers like stomach cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, in a blood sample that comes from these individuals that they're tested what we detect in there is those changes in the DNA that we, would, we just talked about a few minutes ago. Those changes are specific to the cancer cells and not to the cells that they, of the same individual that they, they are not cancer cells. All right. So for the listeners, it's just important to recognize that you and your team, you and your team, were responsible for the original technology of this test from, from nothing, Yes, uh, we developed this test. I mean, it took many years, uh, as we discussed earlier. Oh, not earlier. a weekend? No, it's not a weekend. And, and also, <laughs> of course, we, we, you know, nothing in science is done in a vacuum. Everything is based on knowledge that a lot of other you know, we, um, investigators and other labs have developed over the years, including our group. But, so it's really a team work, and, and it's uh, you know, learning from other scientists in the field and eventually developing something that hopefully is useful. So I'll bring my own jargon to that response. I first learned of the words epigenetics a long time ago. And is it fair to explain it as your DNA is a moving target? 
where you may be predisposed to X, Y, and Z here, but you spend uh, 10 years in LA breathing smog, you're probably at a different predisposition genetically. Is that accurate? I think so. I don't know that it's necessarily a moving target. Another way to think of it would be that the code can change. Mm. So you're born with a code. That code may shift because there's a break in the code someplace, and then that shifts the protein production, the cell processes down another pathway. Or there can be signals that sit on top of the code that don't allow the body's natural replication systems to interpret the code. So you can either break the code, you can mask the code, and that can lead to consequences like precancer and cancer. To add to that, I mean, every cell that we have, my brain cell and my colon cell have the same DNA. But one is a brain, I hope, cell that I have. <laughs> you don't want your colon cells in your brain. <laughs> and the other one is a colon. And the differences for that is those epigenetics, as you call, or marks, and how those are different in my colon cell versus my brain cell and leads it to one, you know, thinking and talking today and the other one, you know, waiting for later. So it's just some of those uh, changes in the pathways that Paul said. So when those are disturbed in either it's a genetic or epigenetic change, they can cause cancer. So you're always trying to like catch up to these changes in your code. In some ways, but you know, we are who we are and you know, the environment around us is what it is. We can change some things, some things we can't change. We can't change what we're born with. Uh, we can make choices, we can follow healthier behaviors, diet, etc. So there are things that we can do that the future is not predestined just based on the genetic code that we're born with. So there are some things that we can do to improve our health outcomes or reduce our risk for diseases like cancers. Right. Our friend Don Barry is on record saying that DNA is not your destiny. Is that fairly accurate or is it like dead spot on? Well, it's more complicated. I think it's somewhere in between. This is not a black and white. Yes, you have your DNA, and, and that is something that you didn't choose, <laughs> right? You, you were born with that. Well, you didn't Paul pick said. your DNA? Come on. I did not pick my DNA, no. I didn't have a little lumber thing to pick. No, right. I did not have that, my DNA. Okay, so, so all right. Uh, dummy down this for the dummy you're looking at here in the studio now. How exactly does this blood test find the cancer if it's pre-cancer is it full-blown cancer you know uh like where in the dna i mean there's no there, is there a sesame street response to this maybe i'll start by saying that we have two genomes two dnas one the one that we're born and then the cancer cells over the time that we grow and and uh, you know during our development they accumulate changes that we talked earlier. So they kind of have their own DNA. There are very few changes, but those are critical changes that they make them cancer cells. So those differences, this is what the technology that we developed does, tries to identify those changes in the DNA that there are present only in the tumor cells, in the cancer cells, but not in the normal cells. And it, it's a lengthy process that, to develop this test, but in the end, it comes down to sequencing, uh, like we, you know, I think that that is very common nowadays, sequencing well, down the DNA. everyone knows that word now because of the okay. pandemic, sequencing. Sequencing, yeah. So that's what we do, and you can d identify this way genetic and epigenetic changes in uh, the DNA that comes from the cancer cells. I mean, it's our own DNA, but it became specific to the cancer cells. We have made such tremendous progress, even in the 30-year career that I've had, Matthew. It's just astounding. And I, quite frankly, think the best is yet to come. There are transformative opportunities that are on the near-term horizon. And now we need to all work together to figure out how we bring some of these major advances in our understanding of diseases like cancer into clinical practice and, better yet, into patients' homes. What Paul said, I agree, but I also I was thinking that when I first read about DNA when I was a student, I really thought it was like, ah, I will never use it for anything besides, you know, passing my exams. And I did think that, and that was short-sighted maybe at the time, but we have made, that also says that within my lifespan, we've <laughs> made such a great progress. And now we're talking about using it and having people take the information from that in order to manage their diseases. I mean, we were also promised flying cars, and we don't have those yet. But I think this is a good substitute for flying cars. Absolutely. There are things that 
if you look backwards to some of the what we called science fiction back in the you know 60s 70s that's actually becoming reality cell phones good example right. you know if you watched star trek you saw the little intercoms that they would use to communicate with each other now we have those devices that we hold in our hand similar things happening in the field of science the idea of walking through a scanner on the jetsons to tell you if you're healthy or or total recall, or total recall. Yeah. you know we're not quite there but conceptually we're getting closer to that state where we can do a whole lot more than we ever would have imagined. When 23andMe came to pass, did you expect there to be as quick of an adoption of that as there was? Because we're only like maybe 10 years away from its kicking off in retail. And now Ancestry is the number one Christmas gift that everyone's giving everyone every year. I did not expect that so quickly, I guess. Sometimes when you're traveling with those things that are happening and you're also part in developing some of them, you always hope that you're going to get it done within, you know, a few years. But I thought it went faster than I expected. And I think also that says something about the people. You said it's the most common Christmas gift. That means that people out there and consumers, they start having faith or, or some trust in what this information that comes from 23andMe or rather providers, and they found it useful. 23andMe is now like a Xerox, right? It just means this for that. They sell it for your dogs, for your nutrition, for obesity, for, uh, you know, propensity, for how much caffeine should I have every day? There are all these websites where you send your stuff there and it becomes like a consumer-facing user experience. Like, have we reached the point where the American consumer is ready to receive and listen because we become desensitized to like the crust of the earth and we're getting into the mantle? Yeah, two sides of the coin, right? So it's great, whatever we can do to get people excited about science, technology, et cetera, particularly if it has potential health implications. I think that's a very good thing. The other side is we may not know what to do with that information yet. I think when some of these genome profiling tools came out and were marketed to consumers, there was so much information that nobody really knew how to use it. It was great for a conversation at a cocktail party, but it didn't really have application to managing your own complicated, complex health issues. So we need to make sure that the technology, the advances in our ability to measure some of these genetic alterations doesn't outpace or at least continue to outpace our ability to take action based on that information. One of the best Best descriptors I heard was somebody called it metatainment. And I think that there's some truth to that. It is that blurring of medical knowledge and entertainment value. And I think we need to shift it more towards this is really powerful stuff. This is incredible. We can do a whole lot with this, but we need to be able to interpret what these gene tests are telling us and uh, apply it based on our understanding of how cancers form, how cancers can be treated, can be detected earlier, et cetera. Metatainment. You heard it here first, folks. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> All right, let's take a quick break, and we'll come back right after this. Just because the American consumer is tolerant for this metatainment expands where they're more receptive and aware and less risk averse. The barrier still exists within the medical practice. Yeah, I think it still agrees. And it goes back to what we just discussed before the break. When you receive some information, whoever this person is, you need to know what to do with the information. Not every information, you know, is at this point interpretable. So, I think where the medical also community can come in is to try and keep explaining this information. So you're going to get all of this information from your genome. Today, not everything is going to be interpretable. Tomorrow or in five years from now, more things will be interpretable. And we need to keep that in perspective. And also what you can do with this information. Just telling somebody, for example, oh, you have disease X. 
cancer, where, but you cannot do anything about it. Is that also something that is useful for the individuals to know if there is nothing to do? And I think those are part of the struggle to utilize this information and what information is good to go to the patient. But not all of the medical um, experts, doctors, scientists agree to how to use this information or even to obtain some of this information. So we have to be very careful. And I think sometimes meditainment It is a way to get people more familiar with something, but it is serious stuff and it has to be done carefully. So we need to be very careful to how we relay results to the individuals that they have taken the test. Nothing is, uh, you know, 100% except for death and taxes that some famous philosopher said once. So let's say, for example, that there is a negative test. That doesn't mean that necessarily this individual does not have cancer. And it's very important as we develop those tests that these individuals continue with the available standard of care at this time. So having a support system for the physicians that they prescribe the test and for the individuals that they take the test, it should be part of how we manage those individuals. And and, uh, I think that that is going to be a key to how those uh, tests, the MSEDs, as we said earlier, could be actually be incorporated in our standard of care. I think you hit on some key points, Nick, and I'll just add too that I think we would all agree that any new advances or proposed new advances should address an important need, an unmet clinical need. Where is there a gap in our current understanding or our current practice that we can do a better job? Then secondly, we need to have a strong, solid evidence base to support the solution that we're proposing. Those two things are necessary, but not sufficient. Then it comes in, there are some sort of outdated studies now that have shown it takes about 17 years for a good idea to get from the lab into routine clinical practice. That can't even vote. That is way too long. That, that is an unacceptable delay in terms of our being able to apply some of these clinical advances. So we need to raise awareness. We need to be able to engage patients, providers, payers, guideline groups, so that all of those barriers to something that may have a potential life-saving benefits like a new cancer screening technology can actually be in the hands of providers and can be used by patients so that they don't have to experience what their previous generation thing that you said about the 17 years is very important. And I had many discussions with a lot of people about that. And I don't understand why we do not learn from history, basically. You know, it's like, yeah, maybe the first time it should take 17 years so we can gain confidence. But when we do a variation of that, it has to go through the path. There's no Moore's law. Right. At least not at the same pace, right? (laughs) Um, So one of the people that helped shape my career and train me, one of my mentors was David Alquist. David Alquist was a big part of this molecular biomarker for cancer early detection story. Back in the 1990s when I was training under Dr. Alquist, he would speak of three components to a successful screening product. You had to have an accurate test. You had to have a test that was acceptable to patients and providers, and you had to have a test that was accessible. And now during, you know, COVID pandemic, that last piece of the equation becomes even more important. So I think we focus a lot on what is the new test? What's the new splashy technology that we can use? How accurate can we make the tool? But sometimes we don't pay as much attention to how are we going to make sure that patients understand it, that providers will use it, that it's easy to use. And, you know, quite frankly, if patients are scared to come into a clinic or a hospital because of exposure to anything, COVID or otherwise, we need to see how we can move out of the hospital, out of the clinic, closer to the point of living, whether that's delivered to a home, whether it's at the local grocery store, someplace. But if we really want people to start taking more control of their health and their preventive opportunities, then I think we need to focus on all three components to that equation. Well, that's a fabulous pivot because prevention has been a word that's kind of been a bone of contention for me personally as someone who was born with brain cancer and was diagnosed in his 20s where there was no way to not get this. But is it fair to start a conversation today that it's easier than ever to try to not get cancer than it used to be? It goes back to 
to the other genome, you know, I, I said that we had two genomes. One right. is the one that we're born, and the other one is the one that develops over time in the cancer cell. So the ones that were bo- the genome that were born, sometimes it has those errors that they could lead to cancer. Knowing that information ahead of time, it is a very useful information because you don't have cancer yet. <laughs> right. Therefore, you could do something to stop uh, the development of the cancer. Uh, that is a different situation from the majority of the cancers, which they come, the, you, you do not inherit changes, rather they happen in our cells. And those, you can prevent them, but you could potentially intercept them and interfere with their growth. And way to do this is try to detect them as early as possible using those MSED tests that we talked about earlier. When I met Fran Drescher for the first time, she had a wonderful quote, maybe six months after her diagnosis of endometrial. And she said, stage one should be the cure. And as aspirational as that is, and ideally we're finding more cancer early because of screenings for populations that have access to screenings, what is before stage one? Is there a way to know about it before you know about it? Yeah, that is a great point. So when we talk about cancer, that is by definition the after the point where cells have broken through their normal boundaries. So invasive disease. Stage one is the earliest stage of that invasive disease. But there is precancer. The process is carcinogenesis. The process goes from normal cell to abnormal cell through some sort of pre-invasive, precancerous stage before it becomes a true invasive malignancy. So if we can understand more about that carcinogenic process, what are the key signals? What are the indicators that we might be able to detect precancers before they become invasive? That's where our ability, our potential to cure becomes dramatically higher. Once cancer cells have broken out of their normal boundaries, then they can go anywhere. And once they can go anywhere, they're much harder to treat. Our treatment options, at least as we understand them today, are just not as effective once the horse is out of the barn, if you will. So we want to be able to understand the process and identify the precancers before they even get to stage one. So let's take one more break and we'll come right back. So for the listeners just chiming in, which is weird because I hope you've been listening to the first half of the show, this show is made possible by our friends at Exact Sciences, and they're partnering with us because we need to talk about Cologuard and this MSED. I'm going to go back to my acronyms here. I'm a fan of both. It's progress. We like these things. It really is, I think, a very nice representation of how something that can be clinically useful comes out of the great science that Nick and colleagues do in the laboratory. So as we can understand the molecular biology, that carcinogenic process, what the inventors of Coligar did was they looked for those signals, that abnormal DNA. They looked for mutated DNA, meaning the DNA code where it was broken. They looked for methylated DNA or epigenetic modifications that go along with cancer. That's the mask on top of the DNA. And by doing sophisticated studies to identify the best panel of markers, they identified these molecular targets that could be measured in stool. If you think about it, precancers and cancers in the colon, those cells are sloughed off and they are evacuated from the body, if you will, in stool. Now you can identify even those microscopic molecular fragments that cancers shed. The Cologuard assay will give a positive or a negative result, indicating the likelihood that there may be a precancer or a cancer or not. And then the next step becomes a more direct test like a colonoscopy if the Cologuard test is positive to not only find a precancer or a cancer, but sometimes even to remove those polyps before they turn into an invasive disease or to get the patient to a surgeon, hopefully at that stage where it is still truly a curable event. Let's talk about accuracy, which is like COVID taught us all this stuff about, well, science is wisdom in the now and that could change tomorrow. But accuracy is something that is a very malleable data point, right? Yeah, I would say that it's never perfect. There's few things in life that are perfect in medicine, the same. So we want to have tests that perform at a level where the benefits outweigh the risks. 
And, you know, those risks can be harmful to the patient. They can be societal with respect to resource utilization, et cetera. So Cologuard is a very good test. It's a molecularly based marker panel to detect early stage cancers. The performance is about 94% detection of early stage cancers, which is on par, not identical to colonoscopy. When we talk about the precancers, there is a balance. So Cologuard, for example, will find many of the precancers, but it's at the trade-off of not generating too many what we would call false positive test results. So it's that balance of performance where the marker panel and the positive or negative result indicates what the patient should do next, not just one time, but over a lifetime. So part of the benefit of any screening strategy with Cologuard or otherwise is you need to stick on the schedule. So for Cologuard, the guideline groups would generally say repeat that test every three years if it's negative so that you can find those precancerous lesions that maybe wouldn't have been detected the last time you took the test. For colonoscopy, for example, the interval is 10 years because there's a different ability and a different emphasis on finding smaller polyps, removing polyps with colonoscopy than there would be with a test like Cologuard. The goal is for now to detect stage one cancer. We talked earlier, this is close to maybe cure in some cases. With uh, pre-cancer, I do not think at this point, at least, that these tests are sensitive uh, enough. You will detect some, but not all. And uh, that could be a a bigger issue because um, we can get into a lot more false positives. So we don't need to detect everything that, that it looks like a growth. Even if a test is imperfect, and all tests are, if we set the strategy at an appropriate frequency, then we can still find cancers even when they've developed, but they are still more curable. So if we have a blood test that doesn't necessarily find all of the precancers, but can find those early stage cancers, we still have an opportunity. I think what we need to continue to educate consumers, patients, providers, everyone, is that Cancer screening is not one and done. Cancer screening is a lifetime commitment over whatever interval is most appropriate for the test or tests that you choose. Yeah, we need to have an intervention for that cancer, right? I mean, we have to have something to do when you get the information. There are not, as far as I know, organized studies that have been done, but drugs that now they're used for late stage cancer and and it's hard, uh, you know, to prolong survival the way that we want to prolong survival, they could potentially work much better when actually they're applied in individuals that they have stage one or stage two cancer at the early stages. So we're in a place now from a public health policy and a a legislative position in this country where the conversation is now mandatory genetic screening for diseases. Where do you guys stand on that? I think it makes a lot of sense. I think that understanding more about an individual's own health and health risks is a good thing. Again, I think where we need to make sure that we are caught up with the technology is how do we use that information? For example, if we have a genetic alteration that's associated with Alzheimer's and your risk goes up by 4% if you have a certain gene pattern versus somebody else's gene pattern and you're 42 years old. What do you do with that information? As Nick pointed out, we should only do the screening test if it's going to lead to something actionable that provides a positive benefit to that person's health outcomes. Again, back to the Alzheimer's examples, all we would do in that situation based on current practice is give that person anxiety and fear of developing something later in life with a very small increase in the risk, but we don't have any way to intervene right now. So I'm not sure that all of the information that we could generate is actually useful, and that's where we need to make sure that we are mindful of appropriate application interpretation of these data. Balancing hysteria, all for it. Yeah, I agree. But also I want to bring something else. What if that person wants to know that may have this, you know, gene that causes Alzheimer's? I think these individuals should also have the choice, but that requires even more education of the consumer, if you wish, or the patient to try to, you know, explain to them what really they're getting into by actually getting the results. So I don't know, mandatory, if we know what we can do with it, but also it should be some freedom in the individual. I think that if they want to know, they want to know. And we need to provide them with the information and the education to understand what they're getting into it. 
We talk a lot about informed choice, and I totally agree with Nick. If somebody wants to have that information, they understand what the results could mean and what they could do about it, and they still want to have the test, absolutely. So there's this Matt Damon movie called Elysium. You know it? Yeah, of course. Where, like, the elite live in space, but they have, like, these Star Trek kind of body scanners in their houses, and every day they get up and go on the scanner— no cancer detected. Enjoy your day. <laughs> like we're channeling. Are we going to get to that point? I'm not sure if we'll get exactly there. But I mean, I in space, at least maybe in L.A. or something. We'll get a whole lot closer to it. I do believe that there is a revolution in our understanding of some of these disease processes. And there are incredibly brilliant scientists and committed investigators around the globe who are trying to put these pieces together in a different way for the betterment of public health. So we will continue to see new opportunities, new clinical tools that can be developed, are developed. It's going to have to be up to the responsibility of all of us to work in parallel to clear out those other application barriers, if you will. So question for you, Nick, what's the role of the, the patient, the advocate, the consumer in this revolution? Well, those are, in my mind, also the beneficiaries of what we do. And, and I think understanding their needs and how they're going to potentially use it for medical products, but they have to have a voice. For me as a scientist, I'm staying in my you know, lab working. I need to know also from them how they feel about what we develop. We have to break a little bit the silos, and the conversation has to include not only you know, the medical experts and what we can do, but we can have a lot more conversation. What actually they feel about the product, I would like to hear that. Do you have like a quick briefer on where we can help out as people with the FDA? I think the answer is that we need to accelerate progress. We need to accelerate the availability of these new advances, these new products that are coming out of laboratories so that they don't sit on a shelf, so that they aren't delayed for up to 17 years before patients can realize the benefits of what we're learning in the lab. That is one adjustment that needs to be done, FDA or any other clinical trial, if you wish, because that's what the approval comes after. Can we find proxies to, you know, waiting for 20 years to see if somebody's going to, you know, die from cancer or get it or so? So that's what I think it's a big uh, active discussion in the field. All right. So we learned today metatainment. We need a better Moore's Law for all of this and that we got to work on better drug development discovery stuff and get the FDA to kind of pony up, right? Is that fair enough? That's fair enough. Yeah. And better understanding of what the results mean. A plug for Coligard and the MSED testing. Uh, how do patients get this? What should they be asking? Uh, what do they need to know about it? And, uh, you know, help the listeners get educated. So colorectal cancer screening for average risk populations should start at age 45. Talk to your clinician about your options, Cologuard and any of the other endorsed colorectal cancer screening tests that might be appropriate for you. You can also get it at cologuard.com through a telemedicine provider if that would be a method that somebody would choose. I love progress. I love progress. All right. Dr. Nick Papadopoulos is a professor of oncology at Johns Hopkins University. And Dr. Paul Lindbergh is the chief medical officer for screening at Exact Science. A great show. Got to have you guys back. Again, big fan. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you. Pleasure. That's all for now. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe, leave a review on Apple Podcasts, follow us on social, and tell all your friends to listen. Tell us what you'd like Matthew to cover in his next episode by leaving a message for us at 855-AUDIO-66, and we might just use it in a future show. Out of Patience is a product of Offscript Health. We are a healthcare engagement company built for patients and caregivers by patients and caregivers. Our executive producers are Matthew Zachary and Andrew McDowell. Our senior producer is Betsy Shepard. Our host is Matthew Zachary. It is recorded, mixed, and edited by Betsy Shepard. For advertising and media inquiries, email media at offscriptnot.com. That's media at offscript.com. For more information, visit offscript.com. <laughs>